Um, let's all stand and let's, uh, let's get things started out with a word of prayer, okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you've given us and we thank you for your blessings. Lord, I ask that you please uh, lead us and guide us into your word and help us to understand what you have for us today. Lord, I ask that you clear our hearts and our minds from the cares and the worries of this world so that we can um, better understand you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I ask that you would uh, be with your word uh, for us who are here and those that um, are absent from our midst. And Lord, whether we're here or whether um, we're not here, some who aren't here, I ask that you would uh, please um, bless us and help us to uh, know and serve you better. Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today we are going to uh, take a little bit of a different approach with things. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to be talking, a l taking a look at what we believe about the Bible. Now, what we have been looking at is we've been looking at church principles for the last several weeks. And if you remember what we looked at last week is that um, the Lord's church really is a position that has the possibility to be lost. And we looked at the Ephesian church and the Laodicean church, and we saw that ultimately the designation between a church, one of the Lord's churches, is Lord's judgment, because after all, he is the head of the church. And so what we looked at is that, you know, as far as the Lord's judgment goes, it's not something that we can look and say, okay, you know, we, we, we need to do this and this and this, and if we're doing these things, we're okay, and if we're not, then that's all right, you know, then that's different. What we need to do is we need to be looking at how can we best serve God? What can we do to best be in His will? But at the same time, we understood that uh, one thing that is, that is there and things that we need to look at is just simply, um, you know, how do we follow the Lord? What, what do we do as far as, as our relationship goes? And that is relationship that is based on faith and what we believe. And so that's where we stop looking at church principles necessarily and start to look at what we believe. And so for the next um, many different weeks, I'm not going to say several because a little bit more than that, uh, actually it's going to take us uh, into the spring. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at what we believe about certain things and so that we can better understand what we as friends in faith believe about our relationship with the Lord and how we can go and serve the Lord. Now, what we're going to be looking at today, starting out with, is what we believe about the Bible. And the reason why this is important is because the Bible is where we get our source of what we believe. And so all the other things that we're going to be looking at from here until the spring, if we don't understand why we believe those things, which is what we're looking at today, then it's kind of like, okay, well, this is what we believe, and, you know, it's this or that or the other thing. You know, there's nothing that's really definite. There's nothing that's really concrete. But today what we're going to do is we're going to look at why we do these things. Why is it that it's important for us to take all the things that we believe and by the way, it doesn't matter what church a person goes to. Churches have certain beliefs. I know that it's a, you know, kind of a, a common thing today, uh, kind of a, a, a hip thing to say, oh, well, we don't really concentrate on teaching. We really don't concentrate on belief. But, you know, it really doesn't matter where somebody goes. There is going to be some sort of underlying belief that's there. Maybe it's written down and agreed upon or whether it's not, but there's always got to be something there, right? And so when we look at this and we say, oh, well, it's this or that or the other thing, we need to know why we need to look at um, the, the, the truth about things, and that is the Bible. The Bible is something that has been given by inspiration. Since it's been given by inspiration of God, it is therefore infallible. And since it is infallible, it is therefore our rule of faith and practice. It has that authority. Um, for us. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today, is we're going to be looking at these three words, inspiration, infallibility, and authority. Okay? All right. So to start out with, we're going to take a look at this, and that is, what is inspiration? And um, really, it's just kind of answering the question as far as who wrote the Bible. Um, you know, when we look at the Bible, we say, okay, well, the, the Bible is given by inspiration. How do we know that? Well, I just want to invite your attention to the uh, book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
in verse number 16. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so when we look at this and we see that all Scripture is God-breathed or all Scripture is, in some other translations, given by inspiration, we need to say that, understand that what, what the Apostle Paul was talking about is that all Scripture, every, every Scripture, it doesn't matter if it's certain books, it doesn't matter if it's Old Testament, New Testament, it, it's, it's everything. And so we don't really have the liberty to go and say, oh, well, this is um, something that's given by inspiration, this is not given by inspiration. You know, it's kind of like, I, I, I call it the perforated Bible. You know, you get to rip out the sections and the pages that you don't like. We don't have perforated Bibles, or at least if we do, we, sh we shouldn't, because all Scripture is given by inspiration. Now, what do I mean by that as far as all Scripture is given by inspiration? Because when you look and you think about that word inspiration, we have a lot of different definitions for what inspiration is and how somebody is inspired. Uh, for example, you know, you might go and, and uh, an, an artist may look at a sunset and he may feel inspired um, to, to, you know, draw a certain kind of picture. Uh, a, a, a writer might, you know, have some sort of life experience and then draw from that for his inspiration of his novel or his book. You know, I might walk across the kitchen and smell a uh, chocolate cake and be inspired to uh, uh, have a second piece. But we have all these different ideas and different definitions about what inspiration is. And if if we look at those different viewpoints about inspiration, we may have a completely different kind of understanding as far as what Paul was saying here. Now, I want you to see that in this uh, verse, in verse number 16, what's translated in the NIV, what's translated in other um, uh, translations is something that I think is a more accurate uh, translation than the word inspired. And that is this word God breathed. As far as the original Greek goes, this is something that would be more literal to the little uh, to the Greek language other than inspiration. And if you think about it, it, it really kind of makes sense because what we're talking about when we talk about inspiration is something that is an inhalation. It is something that is coming in. But this Greek word is talking about something that is going out. It is God breathing out the message. And so what we see from that word and from that concept is that the source of the, the Bible's message is not something that is coming into man, but instead it is going out from God. Now, it is going out from God and it's going into man, but the source and the, the focus of it is that it is going out from God. Now, I want you to look at a couple of different passages with me, and I want us to, to understand how this, is, uh, how this process takes place, because we do have some information about, from the Bible about how this all happened. And I want you to first go to uh, 2 Peter, book of 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse number 20, you notice that he says this, he says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own in interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what Peter is saying here is that the source of that message is not from man. As a matter of fact, in verse number 21, he's pretty emphatic about it, isn't he? He says, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. So when we look at the idea about inspiration, what we are not talking about is Isaiah looking at the sins and the conditions of Israel and then feeling inspired to write something down. It's not talking about, uh, for example, Luke, going through his life with the Apostle Paul and just feeling inspired to write these things down. Instead, no scripture, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Luke, whether it's Second Tim uh, uh, Timothy or Second Peter, no scripture, no prophecy 
had its origin in the will of man. And so when we go back to verse number 20, uh, verse number 20, he says, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. And so the prophets never just simply said, hey, this is what I want to do. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at the book of Jude, you see that Jude actually wanted to write about something different. He wanted to write about Jesus Christ. He wanted to write about what Jesus had done for him. He wanted to write about all of these things, but what he was inspired to write, what the origin of the message that came from God, from God, God breathed out and went into him, was something entirely different, and that is to talk about false teaching. And so the prophets and the writers of the Bible never had within themselves to come up with the message. Instead, as what he says here at the end of verse number 21, is that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I kind of view this word carried along kind of like a, a balloon. Have you ever, uh, you know, gone out, of, you know, like for example, uh, have young kids go to a restaurant, they give uh, young kids a balloon, you know? You go out of the restaurant and the little kid lets it go and goes, Pew. and there it goes, right? You know, it's, it's, it, that's it. I mean, there's no direction in that whatsoever. It's going to be carried along as the wind takes it. You know, hot air balloon. I grew up in New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, the hot air balloon capital of the world. At least that's what uh, it builds itself as. And I think it's right because there's a lot of hot air ballooning going on in Albuquerque. It's a big thing every fall to have a uh, the hot air balloon fiesta. But a um, couple of years, I had a chance to kind of work with hot air balloon pilots and, and go up in hot air balloons. And one thing about hot air ballooning is that you have no choice of where you go. You are going to go where the wind takes you. Now, you do have a choice of, you know, your altitude. And so if you're going somewhere and you're thinking, uh-oh, I don't want to come down there, you know, you can make it hotter and you can go up and uh, you can look up ahead and say, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to go there. And you can pull the cord and you can go down. But as far as where you're going and the direction in which it, it takes you, you are going to be carried along by the wind. Now, that's the same kind of thing as far as what we're talking about here, as far as men speaking from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the message as it is breathed out from God and enters into these men, that these men are therefore going to take that message and write it down or speak it as the Holy Spirit is directing them or carrying them along. They don't have any control over, well, I mean, they have control over, you know, the things that they do and say, because the, 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 the uh, prophecy is controlled by the, the prophet. But as far as the content of the message, if they are really going to be faithful in giving what God wanted them to give, they don't have the power of going where the message goes because they are not the source of it. God is the source of it. God is directing them somehow to write these things down or to speak these things. And as he does, then the message goes where the message goes and where God intends for it to go. And you say, okay, well, how is that all taking place as far as the Holy Spirit coming and then revealing this to the writers and the writers speaking this? And uh, let's go back and take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter um, three, or excuse me, chapter two, first Corinthians chapter two. And let's see a little bit about this. Now, this isn't going to answer all of our questions as far as, you know, well, how, how did this take place? How did they feel? How did, you know, what was all going on within their minds that this, this happened? You know, I, I don't have the answers for that, but what I do have the answers for is a little bit of, of how this process takes place. Now, if you take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse number 12, it says this, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught, to, uh, taught us by human wisdom, but words, uh, excuse me, in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. 
And so what Paul is talking about here, he's saying we did not have all the things that we have is not dictated to us by human wisdom. And you can go back and you can take a look at chapter one and all the way, all the way through chapter three and see that he's really talking about a discussion between human wisdom and godly wisdom, how the godly wisdom and God's wisdom is greater than uh, uh, the world's wisdom. And at the same time, world's wisdom is looking at God's wisdom and saying that's foolishness. And so therefore we don't want to accept it. And so he's saying what we do is we have this revelation given to us. And this revelation that's given to us, which I believe he's talking about, the ones that are writing the Bible, that these are in words that are not taught by human wisdom, but words that are taught by the Spirit. And so the Spirit is revealing this message to them as the message goes out and is breathed out from God and taking the message where God wants it to go. And what is happening is that it is being expressed and expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. And so as Paul is probably, you know, we say Paul wrote the book, for example, the, the letter, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and Paul probably didn't actually write it. He probably spoke it, and somebody like Silas or somebody like Timothy was probably copying the, it down as Paul was speaking these things. And so as the Holy Spirit was moving Paul along to speak these things, he was therefore saying it, and the Holy Spirit also just kind of superintended things so that the things that Paul said was going to be the same thing that God wanted him to say so that Paul didn't have to worry about misspeaking and then, you know, saying something wrong. I've got to worry about misspeaking and saying things wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, you know how oftentimes I get, you know, first and second books confused. And um, as I was going and taking a look at a last minute look at my notes this morning, I noticed that I got first Timothy instead of second Timothy, not once, but twice. <laughs> I had to go back and change it. You know, there's a lot of times that you guys are listening to me and say, ah, he said that. But what he really meant to say was this. When Paul was speaking and Silas or Timothy was copying it down, it, it, there was no sense of, you know, Timothy going, uh, Paul, did you mean to say this? And Paul was going, you know, you're right, I did. It was a case of, you know, the Holy Spirit giving him the message and making sure that what Paul said was exactly what the Lord wanted him to say and therefore write down. Now, at the same time, we need to understand that when we look at the Bible and we see what Paul is saying here, I mean, he's speaking in first person, isn't he? When we looked over in Second uh, Second Peter, we noticed that Peter was speaking in first person. So he's saying, we, I... Things like this. And when you read the Bible and what we've been looking at in the book of Philippians on Bible study night, you notice that Paul's talking about how he feels and what he's going through and, and the different things like that. And so in this idea about God writing the Bible, we need to understand that, yes, it's, it's written by these men and, and, you know, they were and did have liberty as far as what they said and what they, they you know, the words that they used and everything like that so that it was written by them. But at the same time, the message itself was something that came from God, and it is the message itself coming from God that is dictated, not dictated as far as, you know, word-for-word -word dictation, but as far as the content of the message, all the way down to the spiritual truths will be expressed in spiritual words. Now, how all that took place, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, when Paul was, was saying this and, you know, it was being written down. I don't know if, if you, you know, there was a voice in his head. I don't know how that communication of the Holy Spirit came to Paul and everything like that. All I know is what the Bible tells us here, and that is that the Holy Spirit moved men along as they spoke from God. And so we need to understand that what this makes the Bible is God's words. You know, I know that we've got human authors, and I know that there's many times that I say, you know, Paul wrote this, or Peter wrote that, or as Isaiah said, and that is true as far as the human authorship goes. But really, it's God's words. And there are sometimes you, you catch me say something like, God inspired Paul to say, or God inspired Isaiah to write. 
because that's really more accurate to it, right? And that is that the Bible makes, or the Bible is God's words instead of people's words. And that is something that is very important and very cardinal for our understanding about what we believe about the Bible. We need to understand that the Bible truly is God's word. And the reason why is because of this second word, and that is infallible. If we're going to say that God is the source of the Bible, then we need to take the next step and to say that the Bible is infallible. As a matter of fact, we might even ask ourselves the question, and that is, how dependable is the Bible? How reliable is the Bible? How much can we trust the Bible? Can we trust the Bible to, um, um, you know, to a certain degree, or can we trust the Bible entirely? Well, what we believe is that the Bible is infallible because it comes from God. And by being infallible, what that means is that infallible means not able to fail. That means that it is entirely correct. And so when we read the Bible and it talks about how the world was covered in, uh, with the, the flood waters, except for Noah and his family, then we're going to say, yeah, that, that happened. If we're going to understand that the Bible is infallible and it's entirely correct, then we're going to say, yes, Jesus was able to walk on water and Peter was able to come out to him. And we look at that and we say, well, I, I don't understand how that took place. But just because we don't understand how those things took place doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. It just means that we don't understand it. So somebody might come up and say, well, wait a minute. Do you believe that, uh, you know, the Bible, you know, that Jesus turned water into wine and, uh, you know, gave sight to the blind and, and uh, gave, made the, the um, um, mute to speak? Well, yes. Do you believe that he raised, uh, ra raised people from the dead? Yes, including himself. You see, I believe all the things that the Bible tells us about Jesus and about everything else because I believe that the Bible has come from God. Now, if we're going to say that the Bible comes from God and therefore is infallible, um, can't you see that the Bible is really and ultimately tied to God and tied to God's character? Can we depend on the Bible? Well, it depends on if we can depend on God because he's the author. If we can depend on God, then we can depend on the Bible. If we can't depend on God, then we can't depend on the Bible because he's the author. For example, um, you know, if, you, if I were to go and write out a recipe and instructions on making a chocolate cake, um, you may not really have that much faith and confidence in it. And the reason is, is because I have the ability to eat a chocolate cake. I don't know if I have the ability to make a chocolate cake, right? Okay, so somebody's reliability is tied to their ability. If they are able to do something, if they are reliable, then the things that they say are dependable. Now, how dependable is God? Let's take a look at a couple of passages in the Old Testament in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. By the way, uh, Psalm 119 is a song. All the, the Psalms in the book of Psalms are songs. Um, but this song in Psalm 119 is a song about the Word of God. And if you notice, and uh, it is a very long song, um, you notice that all of it has to do with the Word of God. And I want you to take a look at verse 137. Psalm um, 119, 137. Notice that he says this, Righteous are you, O Lord, and your laws are right. So do you see that what we have is that the righteousness of what God decrees is tied to the righteousness of God's character. And so he says at the very first part of it, righteous are you, O Lord. You are righteous. So one thing that we need to understand about God is that God is righteous. And when we look at God, God is righteous. God is somebody, because He is the creator of the heavens and He is the creator of the earth, that God is perfect in everything that He does and everything that He says and everything that, that goes on. 
Now, we may not like what happens, and we may not like what God does, but again, if we don't like it, it doesn't mean that it isn't righteous. It just means that we don't like it. And by the way, there's a lot of things that goes on on earth today that people will want to blame God about, but that is not what God's righteousness is all about. Those were not things that God directly did. It's things that God allows for a bigger plan and a bigger purpose, but to say that God did them, and so therefore, you know, we question God's righteousness is something entirely different. But God is righteous, and because God is righteous, then therefore His laws are right. If we can look at God and we can say that God is the absolute in righteousness, then we can say that what God says or what God decrees is going to be absolutely right. And because God is absolutely right, and what He says is absolutely right, if you look down into verse 142, He says, Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Or your law is true. And so it's not that God's righteousness only exists in the time that He declared His laws, is that God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And so all the things that God does and all the things that God says is going to be in the realm of truth. Okay? So going back to the idea, and that is, can we depend on the Bible? The answer of that is yes. If we're going to say that God is the source of the Bible, that He is the ultimate author of the Bible, and we're going to say that the Bible somehow contains errors and mistakes, then notice how that ties back to his character. If the Bible has errors and the Bible has mistakes, then God has errors and God has mistakes. But if God is ultimately righteous and eternally righteous, then we've got to say that all the things that he does and all the things that he says and the things that he is instructed to be written vis-a-vis -vis the Bible, that those things are absolutely true. And so, when we look at the truthfulness of the Bible, the dependability of the Bible, we've got to go and we've got to tie it back to God. And when we tie it back to God, and we believe that God is who He says He is, then all of a sudden, we can look at the Bible, we can say, well, the Bible is what it says it is, as well. And that is, it is the Word of God. It is truth. Now, I know that some people will say, well, wait a minute, that is belief. And I'll say, absolutely right. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. It's what we believe to be true. Somebody else can have a different viewpoint on it. Somebody can have a different belief. But what matters is what we believe. That's what we're talking about. We believe the Bible to be true because God is true. And if you believe God to be true, and if you believe that God is righteous, then follow that logic through and you can see that the Bible, being God's Word, is going to be true as well. And where that takes us now is our last word, and that is authority. And that is, where should we go for our beliefs? What we say is that since the Bible is God's Word, and what we do is we go and we look to God's Word for our beliefs, we say that it is our rule of faith in practice. Now, I want you to go back to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16 again. It's where we started out. It's where we're going to finish things off. In 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and in verse number 16, it says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What we're saying here is that the Bible has the authority to answer all the things that we need to function, both individually in our Christian lives and also collectively in our church lives as well, because the Bible is our instruction book. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible has the answer for everything, right? You know, as far as is it going to snow next weekend, the Bible doesn't have the answer for that. What's the stock market going to do tomorrow? The Bible doesn't have the answer for that. There's going to be tons of questions that come up in our minds that we say, yeah, but what about this? And we need to understand that the Bible doesn't have all of those answers. But what answers the Bible does have are the answers that we need to know. 
again, looking at this, we see that all Scripture is God-breathed, and so therefore, what is it good for? What can it do? Well, it is useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for correcting. It's useful for training in righteousness. In other words, all the things that we need to do to carry on as Christians. Sometimes we need to be instructed about things. That is, we need to learn things and we need to grow. Sometimes we need to be corrected about things. We're going on a certain direction and all of a sudden we need to get off of it and go somewhere else. Sometimes we need to be rebuked by it. You know, we, we're kind of stuck on that path and we need to be uh, jolted to get off into something else. And at the same time, it is something that's going to train us in righteousness because that's ultimately the goal for us in our individual Christian lives and us as far as our collective lives here at Friends in Faith. We are seeking to serve God. We are trying to live lives that please Him. In other words, we're trying to do things in righteousness. So where are we going to go in order to find these things out? Well, the Bible, because that's what it's useful for. That's what we're here for. That's, that's, what, we, you know, that's, that's what it's here for. It's to instruct us in all of those things. How we look at the Bible is really going to determine what we do with it. How a person looks at a Bible is really going to determine what a person does with it. For example, if somebody is a secularist, they're probably thinking that the Bible just simply comes from people, right? The Bible is just a book. People just wrote the book. And because of that, they're just simply saying, hey, it's, it's just like anything else. It can be maybe a little bit of fact. It can be a little bit of fiction. Don't know, don't care, because it just simply comes from a person. And because of that, what they are left with is I am free to do whatever I want to do. I don't need to worry about what God says. I don't need to worry about, you know, um, God's judgments. I don't really even care to, to know what the Bible says about particular things. Maybe it's got some good human wisdom and human philosophy in there. Maybe there's some, some good sayings in there that I can agree with, but I'm really ultimately left on my own for my determination, my decisions between right and wrong. You see, there's that viewpoint. Whatever your viewpoint is, then therefore that's what it's going to govern how you're going to view things, right? At the same time, some people will view the Bible as far as from a kind of a secular religious point of view. And that is, they're going to say, well, okay, um, some of the Bible came from God, but not all the Bible came from God. You know, they're going to say, well, you know, maybe this little section God inspired, but all these other things, now that, that, that's really not the case. Well, when you start to take that approach, or you start to say that the Bible really originated from man, but, you know, there's... God certainly had his involvement in it, then it just simply contains the truths that we want to pick, right? And so if we want to do this, then we're going to say, hey, this is true, we're going to do it. But if there's something in there that we don't want to do, we're going to ultimately say, no, that, 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 that's not true. And so therefore, we're free to leave it alone. However, if we view the Bible as far as it is coming from God, then the ultimate conclusion that we've got to view is that because God is perfect, the Bible is truth. And since the Bible is truth, then therefore what we need to do is to conform our lives around it. What it says, we should accept. We may not understand it, but at the same time, we're going to say it's right. It may be something that rubs us the wrong way, but ultimately, we're going to say that's what needs to, to be done. You see, if we're going to say that the Bible is truth, then what we're ultimately going to be doing is looking at it for that idea about instruction, about rebuking, correction, and training in righteousness. So that is, we go to verse number 17. It says, so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We look and we see the Bible as far as something that even if we don't like it, even if it's something that's going to rebuke us or, tr or correct us, or it's going to educate us in one way or another, we're going to look at it as far as something that we need 
so that we can go on and we can be thoroughly equipped to do the things that God wants for us to to do in our lives. And so don't you see how it's important for us to have an understanding about what the Bible is and have an understanding about how it came about and how to have a proper understanding about what inspiration is. You know, you may be listening to this and you may be thinking, you know, I, 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 I know all this. I've heard all this, but it's a nice reminder. And you know, it needs to be reminded. We all need to be reminded about it every now and then. As a matter of fact, we're not going to look at it, but if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, you notice that that's what uh, Peter starts out in the verses before he was talking about the inspiration of the scriptures. He is saying, I am here to stir up your remembrance of these things, and I'll do it as long as I'm in the body. We do need to be reminded about these things. You may be listening to this and you may be thinking, you know, I, I, I knew some things and I believe some things, but now all of a sudden I've got some added information and, and things become more clear to me. Well, good. I mean, that's the idea about learning and about correct, you know, growing and developing. But then again, you may be listening to this and you may be thinking, you know, I've never thought the Bible that way, but maybe I need to change my thinking. Well, again, it does come down to belief. You know, I'm not going to be able to prove to you anything. I'm not going to be able to prove to you God's existence. I'm not going to be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt about the Bible's reliability and authority. I'm not going to be able to do any of those things. Now, there's evidence of it, and I can make an attempt at it, and you can look and weigh the evidence and say, hey, yeah, you know, you're right. But at the same time, where it's going to come down to is just boiling down to your belief. What do you choose to believe? Do you choose to believe that God is real or not? Do you choose to believe that God wants to be involved in people's lives? Or do you not? If you're going to believe that God's real and that He wants to be involved in people's lives, then don't you think that He would have allowed and left a record for that to happen? And that record of his will is the word of God. And so today, if you're listening to that, you're like, you know what? That makes sense. Then believe it. Trust it. And one thing that the Bible says very clearly is how we can be reconciled back to God. The Bible says that all men are sinners. And because that, we've fallen short of the glory of God. We can accept that by faith and just simply say, oh, well, it's true because the Bible says it. Or maybe we could just simply say, is it true? Well, look at our lives. Look at the lives around us. We know good people. We know very good people. But have you ever known a perfect person? There's only been one, and that's Jesus Christ. Perfection, not as far as a popularity poll of the people around him, but perfection as far as what God had for him to do and that he lived up to God's standards and God's laws and took that perfect life and sacrificed it on a cross. And the reason why he sacrificed it on a cross so that if any, anybody, doesn't matter who it is, if anybody would look at what Jesus did and see that he did that to pay the way for our salvation, we're sinners, Because of that, we're condemned to hell. Jesus is perfect, but yet he died in our place. And when we see that Jesus did that for us, and we believe that to be our salvation, and we turn and we accept that, and we go to the Father asking for forgiveness, or asking for salvation, or asking for mercy, or however we want to ask it, but when we turn and repent to God, then we have eternal life. So today, if you haven't turned and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I hope you do. So, how are we seeing the Bible? Well, let's understand. Let's understand who we are. Let's understand and not forget what we're about. And the number one thing that we're about is just simply the Bible is God's Word. The Bible is God's truth. And when we understand and have that, then everything else can flow and function in its proper place. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. 
Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for the time that we've had in your word today. And Lord, I ask that you please uh, take your word and bless it to our hearts and lives. Lord, I ask that you would please help us to understand it, help us to believe it, and help us to believe that you are on your throne and that you're perfect in all your ways. Lord, I ask that you please be with whoever uh, hasn't accepted you and um, help them to understand what it means to be saved before it's too late. And Lord, uh, please be with us the rest of the service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.